honoured to have with us Harrow's newly appointed headmaster, Mr Jim Hawkins. Educated at Brasenose College, Oxford, Mr Hawkins read mathematics and took his PGCE. He taught at Radley College before being appointed head of mathematics at Forest School, East London. He was deputy head of Chigwell School and appointed headmaster of Norwich School in September 2002 until taking the role of headmaster at Harrow in August this year. Mr Hawkins takes his place in a school steeped in history. Founded in 1572 under the Royal Charter granted by Elizabeth I and situated in northwest London, Harrow has witnessed many famous statesmen and artists pass through its door. This list includes Peel, Palmerston, Churchill, King Hussein of Jordan, Byron, Sheridan, Trollope, and also Lord Raleigh, just to name a few. Safe to say, many Harrovians have gone from this seat of learning to have distinguished careers in business, the law, medicine, the armed forces, the arts, and also media. A full boarding school, Harrow believes in the virtues of being an all-boys school and also aims to produce young men who will go on to become leaders in their chosen professions and be of good influence in today's world. Harrow embraces a balanced mix of tradition and future trends, inspiring boys to develop their talents and reach for excellence in everything they do. The 805 Harrovians also enjoy their own school song, their own form of football, and also unique terminology. And it's with this terminology that I affectionately say to Mr Hawkins that as head beak, I welcome his talk that will no doubt be send up and we hope that he didn't have to experience too many tolly ups to finish it. Ladies and gentlemen, explaining why independent schools are important, please welcome Harrow's headmaster, Mr Jim Hawkins. Well, good morning, everyone. It's very good to be here. Very grateful for the invitation. I'll speak from here, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions a bit later on. And uh, I'll speak generally about the independent sector, but also, if I may, plug Harrow a bit and uh, talk about the Harrow experience, which for me is 10 days old. Now, of course, you'd expect this, but I am now a confident and enthusiastic advocate of independent education. But if I'm honest, when I went into teaching in the independent sector 23 years ago, I was less sure about that, partly because on my PGCE course, I think I'd been made to feel a little guilty about going into independent schooling, as though somehow I was avoiding the real thing and was going to a pampered alternative. As I set out, my first teaching job was at Radley College. For me, that was my first experience of public school and of boarding school directly. I was state educated myself, went to a grammar school in Birmingham. And I was drawn into that job for a combination of things. I love teaching mathematics. There are people that do. I also loved the breadth of extracurricular experience that I'd had at university and at school. I loved playing rugby. I loved rowing. I loved coaching the two sports. And my first job allowed me to do all of those things. And as a bachelor don, I was able to throw myself into all of that and learned a huge amount very quickly. But the tension that I felt at the time, the ideological tension, uh, the sense of, well, you know, I'm going to this sector. How does that work in terms of our overall educational perspective? We still see that tension all around us in the way that our sector is portrayed. Now, I assume I'm preaching mainly to the converted perhaps totally to the converted, because you're here at this show. But still, it's relevant to our general thinking about uh, public schools and independent schools. I must, of course, note that independent schools is a big catch-all. It covers a wide range and lots of different kinds of places. My HMC colleagues, who are heads of day schools, let's say urban day schools, are exasperated. Whenever there's a story about independent schooling, there's a picture of a Harrovian in a hat that goes with the, uh, the piece that the journalist has written. There are, of course, yes, the, the great public schools, but I've worked in, in various other excellent schools. I worked in Forest School, which is in Walthamstow, and its address, it says near Snaresbrook. 
Um, I then went to Chigwell, Birds of a Feather Territory, and uh, then on to Norwich School, a beautiful day school in the Cathedral Close, an ancient school dating back to 1096, and here I am at another historic place, getting used to the ways and the traditions of Harrow. So many different kinds of independent schools across the age range, and many of those represented here at this show. Although there are great differences, and of course, in my experience, I've taught in day, in boarding, in a combination of the two. I've taught all boys classes, all girls classes, co-educational groups, and in urban and rural environments, and enjoyed all of those places. I think outstanding independent schools do share a lot of qualities and are admirable for them, and I will talk about that at greater length. We also, I'm going to go into defensive mode first of all, we share some common frustrations based on those attitudes that I began with. We are and have been under attack, most recently via charitable status issues, also through over-regulation, the inspectorate, even the independent schools inspectorate having to follow national guidance and reducing our independence. And the way that we are portrayed in the media is terribly unhelpful at times, well, regularly so. And there are a regular stream, there is a regular stream of dubious statistics. The one that annoys me most is this 7% statistic, which is always trotted out when social mobility is mentioned. Isn't it outrageous that 30 to 40% of Russell Group undergraduates are from the independent sector, or nearly half the top civil servants, or a third of MPs? come from the independent sector when only 7% of the population go there. Well, what's misleading about that, I'll explain as follows. Firstly, about 14% of the population go to the independent sector at some point in their schooling. But even more importantly, we should be aware that if you look at the difficult A-level subjects and the top grades achieved in them, then statistics around the 40 to 50% mark for subjects in modern languages and the applied sciences and those most difficult subjects that give you the passport to the top selective universities, which then lead to those careers, then the statistics are pretty close. You could argue that you should expect about 40% of some of those leading professions to come from our sector because we are the schools that are generating that proportion of grades which open the doors later on. And it's completely upside down to say, let's punish the universities for not finding more talent in other sorts of schools. Surely the job of all schools is to stretch and to nurture the talent and to present universities with uh, the quality for them to deal with. But you'd expect me to say that, wouldn't you? Now, you could argue as well that the independent school's attitude towards these hard subjects is key to our country. The fact that applied sciences and classics and related subjects arguably have survived in some universities is down to us. We've provided the pupils to fill those courses, and that must be borne in mind. But just an aside on social mobility, I've talked about the professions that result from the selective universities, but it's also notable that even in the arts, in uh, the entrepreneurs in life, and also in pop music, from Coldplay to James Blunt, there is an extraordinary proportion of influential people and successful people that comes from the independent schools. Is that outrageous or admirable? Looking at it positively, I would say one reason why talented people do well from our schools is because when they are with us, they gain a range of experiences that goes far beyond the academic. They learn how to play in teams, they learn how to debate, they learn how to um, work alongside other people and deal with hardship, believe it or not. I talk about that very mindful of the fact that I'm training for long ducker at Harrow. I'm doing short long ducker, let me explain. Lots of the boys in the beaks at Harrow in the first weekend in November on a Sunday morning will be running from the school to Marble Arch and back. About 40 boys, about 20 of the beaks, the masters and several hundred boys will do the halfway. They'll be dropped off at Marble Arch and have to run back to school. I wonder how many schools put their pupils and their teachers through that sort of thing. Anyway, it's getting me fit. So um, I think those sorts of experiences that we deliver actually do um, create and develop pupils that go far beyond the academic and also are able to succeed in a more general sense. Also, it's not often stated, 
in these stories about social mobility that our schools are good agents of social mobility. The new head of school and deputy head of school at Harrow are both Beckwith scholars who are there on generously supported uh, places in the school that come from backgrounds where they couldn't afford those places. The talent has been spotted and they are now young leaders in a great school. If you look at, for example, Cambridge University, those undergraduates that could be classified, it's probably not the right terminology these days, but from a working class background, low income background, then it's a very high proportion of those undergraduates that are independent school products via bursaries. At one time, it was approaching half of them. I don't think it's quite as many as that now. But that's an extraordinary thing, not often mentioned by journalists when writing stories about the social mobility issue. The independent schools are actually, and this is statistically backed up, better than the current grammar schools at enabling those from um, relatively low-income backgrounds to go to the great universities. We've also had in the news recently this whole business about uh, whether you should have internships and whether the old boy, old girl network should be used. Now, of course, we're all against people getting an unfair um, position in work or in society, but I would say that networking is a natural part of being a human being. And our schools very positively create that network for our boys in a boys' school, but also boys and girls in... Uh, in girls' and co-ed schools. That's a natural thing. And our schools develop a great sense of loyalty. Several reasons. Pupils enjoy it there, and they want to keep in touch with one another after leaving the school. But also, the dedication of the teachers and the way that they go the extra mile engenders that sense of family uh, commitment, support, loyalty. And that is bound to continue. Now, in saying all of this, I must acknowledge that there are state schools that have some of these qualities, but frankly, not in the quantity or in the availability to the general population um, that they should be. So, yes, networking, pros and cons, but uh, there are many positives for what happens in the public schools. It's also true to mention, of course, that the independent sector have got a lot better at reaching out and being involved in wider society. I agree with politicians that all of us who have privilege, that's the schools, well-resourced schools, the pupils um, and uh, the staff, help others and engage with others and come up with mutually beneficial partnerships. All sorts of initiatives across the country, um, both through academies and free schools and also other uh, outreach projects are being done to great effect. There, Lord Adonis and uh, the Secretary of State, Michael Gove, I think, are absolutely right in pushing us and reminding us that we have a duty to the wider system. What is another role of the independent sector that's very positive? Well, we are conservative places with a small C. Uh, we conserve the best in education. You could argue, and I've already alluded to this, in being in a state school myself at the time when uh, teachers' action was diminishing the amount of extracurricular and sporting involvement in schools, you could argue that the independent sector has kept a lot of those things going. And the state sector is now able to return to those and say, yes, it was a good idea after all. Had the independent schools not existed, arguably some of those key elements of education could well have died. Also, the benefits of a traditional liberal arts education, as seen in Toby Young's new free school, uh, not so very far from here, an acknowledgement that every individual, not just those in the public schools, should have an opportunity to read the great literature, to study the traditional strong curriculum. And, well, let me as, uh, give my views on some recent developments in the state sector. Instead of thinking that we teach citizenship and being a good person by inculcating it via citizenship lessons, I think we're better off learning about human nature in Shakespeare, learning about exciting historical topics, learning about the importance of the vote via studying the suffragettes than some earnest lesson which tells you the way to think and how to behave in accordance with what the state wants. I think that's one of the areas where independent schools have done a great job in maintaining excellence in education. Only the other day, Michael Gove was saying, let's stop being the thematic in science and having uh, whole courses all about um, current environmental issues, let's teach the pure science first. 
let's understand about chemicals and, and uh, physical laws and so on, and then afterwards and they can apply that knowledge in important issues such as dealing with the environment. Also, along the theme of being conservative, we, of course, are pretty strong on discipline and uniform. And, of course, we now see academies wearing blazers that uh, are very sort of prep school in style with all the, the piping and so on in acknowledgement of the fact that outward appearance matters and is an outward sign of, of discipline and good behavior. I'm also a great believer in strangeness in education. Now, I've just arrived at a school where the boys wear these hats on the high street to and from lessons. They have to cap the beaks. What does that mean? Well, if they walk past a teacher, a beak, they touch their hat to acknowledge them, and the beak does this strange sort of imaginary hat touching in return. Um, it seems very odd at, at first glance. But actually, the more I've experienced it over the last 10 days, I've really remarked upon its value. Because one thing that it does in a very unique, traditional, harrow way is it ensures that we all acknowledge one another. In an era when, in every high street, we can walk past teenagers who are totally plugged into something else and not the slightest bit aware of adults or other company walking past them, it's absolutely delightful to find young people walking past looking you straight in the eye and saying, yes, I know you're there. And that is an outward sign of Harrow community. And uh, I welcome it, and I'm insisting they keep doing it. That's one example. Um, we've already heard about the Harrow songs. I had my first experience of these last night. I was at an uh, old West Dacrian's dinner. Uh, it was one of the 12 houses. And every Harrow occasion of that kind ends with the singing of primarily late Victorian songs, the most famous of which is... 40 years on, you may know about it. They are sung with great passion, pretty tunefully as well, and it's a marvelous sense of, sort of corporate togetherness in a traditional way. Now, other schools have other things, but I think it's, it's to the great benefit of the school. I've already talked about the Harrow House system. All 12 of the main houses have a unique character. They're all very different buildings. have got garden areas out the back, all of, of, with their own different style. And um, the housemasters, of course, are all different characters. So we've got 12 little schools within a school. It's absolutely fascinating to learn how all of that works, but I value it. Another area where nationally perhaps the independent sector has, has really helped is in traditional ethos as seen in school chapels. I think it's pretty outrageous, actually, that the law of the land is not applied by Ofsted as it goes around the school. A blind eye has been perpetually turned towards the need for schools to have a daily act of worship. And yet again, in the independent sector, it happens daily or almost daily in most places. And of course, finally, on that part of, uh, of this theme, we are, I hope, also a, a yardstick in terms of absolute qualities. Much talk about grade inflation. There's no doubt grade inflation has happened. If we take measurements such as uh, Oxbridge success and also uh, the numbers of pupils getting into the other selective universities, that's stayed pretty constant for a lot of independent schools. Meanwhile, the A's and A stars are going up and up and up. So we have a role to show that standards uh, are maintained and uh, that the national examination system needs to be mindful of that. But it would be wrong just to say that independent schools are all about staying where they are and doing the same thing over and over again and just saying, we told you so. We are very innovative places. If we look at some of the exciting developments in the examinations framework that have developed over the last few years, international GCSE was taken on by a small number of independent schools because they saw that there was a qualification that avoided controlled assessment, that avoided too much coursework, that was not modular, and tested the, them at the end of the course. And in mathematics, for example, was about traditional number and algebra work and less about wordy problems. So um, a few independent schools took that on. Quite a bold move, because they instantly got 0% in their government league tables, which, if they're in a competitive environment, needs some explaining. But they've done it. And now those qualifications are becoming open to the state sector as a result to that pioneering action. I think that's admirable. Also, not exclusively, but the International Baccalaureate, of course, is very strong in many independent schools. The new, relatively new, pre-U, pre-university qualification, which uh, a number of uh, independent schools are pioneering, that is very interesting too. But looking more traditionally, you look at the way a school like Winchester has had its div system, where 
individual teachers will share their passion for esoteric subjects and so on with, uh, with individual boys. That's, that's terrific. And the teaching of subjects like philosophy to go along conventional national curriculum uh, subjects, that's another development in our sector. I thought it was rather curious when last Thursday a number of uh, heads, including myself, were invited to number 10 to talk to the Prime Minister and the Secretary of State about educational ideas. On the news, uh, it was announced the BBC can reveal that heads of these schools have been sneaking into number 10 to, uh, to speak to the Prime Minister as if the government were dabbling in witchcraft. I would hope that in the future there would be a real sense of acknowledging the strength of our sector and openly uh, and unashamedly we would say, well, let's look to see what others can learn and, of course, for independent schools to learn from initiatives in the state sector. Wouldn't it be great to get away from this constant hang-up and tension that I began with and uh, see our, our sector as being to the national benefit? My first impressions of, of Harrow, I hope you will uh, be picking up, are tremendously positive. Crucially, I find the boys amazingly down-to-earth, confident but not arrogant. Yes, self-assured from the experience that they have, great at um, speaking to adults and so on, but, but not in a, an overbearing or patronizing way. It's an absolute delight to be there. I'm so excited about being in school communities, and I'm now finding that full boarding environment um, a, a great place to be where one can really sense um, all those strengths that I've been talking about coming to fruition every day. So I'll pause there and give you an opportunity to ask me questions. It can be about general points to do with the independent sector or specifically about Harrow. It's up to you, but thank you for your patience so far. Thank you very much, Jim. If I could ask our audio expert um, to grab the microphone. Has anybody got any questions for Jim? That's okay, I have a few. <laughs> we, uh, we actually asked some of our readers um, some questions to ask you, and one of them came up as, if you can afford it, is boarding preferable for most children? Boarding is great, I've just been talking about that. It's not for everybody, that's, that's absolutely clear. And I think um, one of the joys of nowadays <clears throat> is that there are, in the independent sector, lots of great schools of all the different types I've talked about. And I think it's a matter for parents to decide um, which school they want according to various factors, among which are single sex or co-ed, boarding or day. If it's boarding, how much boarding? Do you want flexibility? Do you want to be visiting a lot? Or do you want to um, just see your children more at exeat weekends and half term and holiday? Those are key factors for families these days. And there's a great choice. If you can afford it, yes, but do bear in mind that um, lots of schools um, run bursary schemes and means-tested schemes to allow a broader range of uh, you know, socio-economic backgrounds than you might immediately expect. And, um, of course, the well-resourced schools tend to have even bigger bursary funds than, than those that are operating on tighter budgets. So, um, yeah, I, not for everybody, but for boys and girls who love that sense of, of being in amongst it the whole time and being in a community and if as a parent you want an environment such that in the evenings for example they're never at a loose end they're never bored they've got structured time you know when they're not doing prep they're charging around you know playing five aside or going to society meeting and the school you know doesn't sleep until well into the evening and um, frankly you know the some of the negative um, pressures of today's world and environment are, um, are simply not there during time time. They're just you know, getting on with an all-around education. If that's for you, then boarding can be for you. But I can also imagine boys and girls that, that need daily um, support you know, in the evenings from their families because that's just the kind of person they are. Okay, thank you very much. Anybody else? Or shall I go back to our readers? <laughs> okay. Um, probably, considering the time, um, yeah. Oh, sorry, we have a question over here. Good morning. Good um, morning. In the same vein, um, single sex schools or co eds? Mm. Yeah, good question. As I mentioned, I've, I've worked in all types. I've, I have got um, clear views on this. I think that, let me start with what I don't think. 
Um, there is a lot of, to justify their existence, all boys' schools, all girls' schools, and co ed schools um, put out propaganda about, you know, it's, this is the only way, and make, try to make parents feel that there's something wrong with you if you're sending them to the other kind of school. I don't like that at all. I think there are great schools of all kinds, great um, all boys, great all girls' schools, and there's some fantastic co ed schools as well. And I think it's just plain daft for someone that works at a school like mine to say that. You know, Kings Canterbury, Rugby, uh, Marlborough, and and similar are are you know not good schools. They're great schools. So, and actually, and what I do think is this: that that the if you look at the cogent research on the results achieved in those different kinds of schools, the two biggest factors that influence child's performance are the backgrounds of the pupils in terms of finance uh, and, and so on, and also the ability of the pupils on entry. Those are the two most significant factors that affect the performance of the school as seen in league tables. So the highly selective London day schools, for example, they are, they are creaming off the top 0 point whatever percent of the population. They're great schools, but those pupils would teach themselves to A stars. So you've you just got to bear that in mind. It's, it's very significant when looking at league tables to think, well, what kind of school is it? How selective is it? Are there 20 to 30 applicants per place? Or you know, do they just take most of the pupils that apply and have a pretty comprehensive intake? And there are many great independent schools that in the latter category where their value added is absolutely superb. So all this talk about, oh, look at the league tables, it's, um, you know, it's, it's all girls schools in the top five and then a few all boys and the, then the rest. That may be historical as well, you know, in terms of you know, the way that schools were founded. Um, however, going back to my last point, the parental choice, I think one must weigh up. Looking at your boy or girl, where are they going to thrive? I now see hundreds of Horovians that are absolutely right for that environment and um, would quite rightly wouldn't want it to be co-ed, neither would their, their parents. Um, the advantages being, the, the standard things you'd expect me to say, the absence of, of distraction, you know, being able to get up in the morning and go to breakfast without being able to, apart from making sure your top button's done up and shirt's tucked in, worrying too much about um, your parents during, during those rather turbulent adolescent years. That, that's a real advantage. Also, I think it is true to say, when I've taught in co-ed environments, one needs to employ a wider range of uh, teaching techniques because boys and girls in a mixed class demand a wider range of approaches. I'm not saying that's, that's bad, but it's different. And certainly at, at, at Harrow, there, were, there are Beaks who are absolutely brilliant at teaching boys. They may be slightly less good at teaching a co-ed class or an all-girls class. Um, so again, it's it, environment. Um, and I think it is good that there is a range of opportunity for parents. Okay, another question if we could fit just one more in. Morning. I was just wondering what your views were about attracting overseas students. Attracting, well, let me talk about, about Harrow. Um, the, Harrow has a great tradition going over many decades of um, being very cosmopolitan and international, going back to Nehru, um, Prime Minister of uh, India and also um, you know, the Jordanian royal family and, and many other great families. And Harrow right now um, has a wonderful um, group of, of internationally based um, pupils, boys. Um, I think where as a school, I mean, Harrow, Harrow is, is greatly blessed of being heavily oversubscribed and is, we're about having a, a healthy mix of um, brilliant boys at the top end boys who are good all-rounders, good enough academically, um, also um, from all around the UK and uh, different parts of the world. But the schools have to, to balance things. I think it must be difficult in schools where they feel pressure to do recruitment of, of various kinds. Um, Harrow isn't like that, but um, there are some that, uh, you know, there are pressures as the world economy fluctuates, suddenly to take more pupils from here and fewer from here. Um, but, but we are in, you know, um, in a world where uh, you know, we need to, to keep going and to manage our, our finances. So I don't know if that answers your question. I, I don't think um, schools, many schools, would set out saying, right, you know, let's, let's recruit um, lots of pupils from this country or, or that country. It's about achieving balance, I think. Okay, that's all we have time for. Oh, okay, if it's a short one. <laughs> Thank you.
Good morning. Uh, Oliver Reed from Sidcott School. Um, I just wanted a quick question about the alumni system at Harrow and how you see that impacting on the educational experience for yeah. current students. For me, it's one of the great defining factors of an independent education is that connection with previous pupils. And obviously, you've listed earlier the um, alumni and their success in industry. I just wondered if you can just uh, say a couple of words on that. So, how a good alumni network is achieved, or what, what happens a at Harrow? Absolutely. Yeah, I, I think um, s successful schools do generate a natural affinity and loyalty. Um, in terms of the techniques that schools use to maintain that network, there's a lot of socialising involved, which is great, giving people opportunities to get back together, school reunions, house reunions. But then, practically speaking, um, at Harrow, an, an extraordinary number of old Harrovians are keen to uh, help the next generation, to give them opportunities to find out more about future career possibilities, um, to advise them, and of course your recent alumni in the universities. You, you can actually send a, a current boy off to a university to meet someone who's already there, and they can, in a very natural way, talk about the pros and cons and, and how life is. So those sorts of things are great. And then of course, um, I mentioned the Beckwith scholarships earlier, Beneficiaries um, include the head of school and deputy head of school at the moment. There's an example of someone who was a scholarship boy at Harrow himself and who uh, then went on to an extraordinarily successful career and has felt impelled to, or compelled to, um, to give back and to provide what he had to others. And I think that's wonderful that, that our schools are not only giving people a great ed education, but engendering a sense of uh, philanthropy and giving back to their old school, but also the world at large. One of the aims of, of Harrow is to make sure that young men know that they've had privilege, they've had a great education, and that they are going to be um, working in their lives for the good of their families and their, their network, but of the wide, wider world. And there's a great tradition. Lord Shaftesbury was a Harrow boy and uh, look at his influence on uh, the 19th century world. And one of my dreams and aspirations is that some of those Harrow boys that are wandering around the hill now will be people who will do great things that will affect millions of others positively later on. Ladies and gentlemen, please thank Jim Hawkins. Thank you. Thank you.